with some stand-up comedy. Uh, if you don't find me funny, it's okay. I'll only be up for about 90 minutes. I got about 90 minutes of material and then I'm out. And I also, I have a day job as a doctor, so if it doesn't work out for me, that's fine. Okay. Do we have, uh, do we have any Movember people here? Any mustaches here? Can we get a shout out for the mustaches? Okay, we got one guy back there. One guy right there, okay. We got two. Okay, we got two guys carrying the torch for mustache cancer. All right, that's great. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you guys a story. Um, so I went paintballing recently. I went, uh, I went to play paintball. Hey, Puya, Puya was there. It was my first time going to play paintball in my 30s. The last time I went to pay, play paintball was in my 20s. And that's, uh, that's quite a different experience for the low back and the joints, uh, let me tell you. Because I'm, I'm 32 now, but my ego very much thinks that I'm still 22 years old, and it's starting to cause a lot of problems for me. So, the paintball guy that's head of our team, the referee guy, he's explaining uh, the game it's about to start. He's like, all right, listen up. This first game, the object is we got to get one of you guys to that fire bunker over there. If our team can get somebody in that bunker first, we got a real chance of winning. So I need all of the fastest guys up front. You guys are going to sprint to the bunker. So all these high school, college age kids, four or five of them, they move up to the front and my ego's like, Psst, you're probably the fastest on this team. You're probably faster than all these kids. You should go up front. If you don't make it to the bunker, your team's going to lose. And everyone on your team's going to die. That's what's going to happen. My ego it likes to catastrophize things. Now, where my ego actually got the idea that I'm fast, I have no idea. Because the amount of running I do on a regular basis is about seven minutes on a treadmill once a week. And that's followed by two shots of Ventolin immediately after. <laughs> I, I won't even do the full 10 minutes. I get to seven minutes and my brain goes, oh, that's pretty good. That's almost 10 minutes, seven out of 10, we can round up. Seven out of 10, that's a pass. Yeah, you're good. So the whistle blows and I start doing a mad dash for this bunker. It's about 50 yards away and I get halfway there and I notice there's this little fence about yay high just under my waist and my ego's just like, jump over it. So I jump over it. And as I'm landing, the ground is a little uneven and my knee kind of twists out a little bit as I land. And my knee lets out this shriek. It's the first time my knee ever spoke to me. And I don't speak cartilage or meniscus, but I'm pretty sure what it said was, well, that was a mistake. <laughs> so now I'm landing mangled by this fence. Uh, there's still about 10 minutes left in the game. And over the next 10 minutes, my nice green coat coveralls are slowly painted a nice Oompa Loompa orange by enemy fire. And my, my knee decides, oh, well, this is probably a pretty good time to have a heart-to-heart -heart with my ego. So my knee's like, ego, listen. Me and the ankles and a couple of the lumbar vertebrae have been talking, and uh, you're going to have to let us start calling some of the shots from now on. You know? you're, not, you're not 22 anymore. It's a bit of a rude awakening for my ego. My ego didn't like to hear that, but reluctantly, it was a very necessary lesson. And it lasted. My ego was settled for about two weeks. So fast forward to two weeks later. Now I'm going for ice cream with my daughter. So we leave my apartment, and behind my apartment, there's this concrete barricade. Uh, it's about four concrete blocks, and it's connected by a nice chain. The chain's about yay high. You might say it's about the same height as the paintball fence from about uh, two weeks earlier. So as we're approaching this barricade, my daughter just blurts out, jump over that chain, daddy. <laughs> and now my ego, which has been impressively dormant for the last two weeks, is basically like, hold my beer, kid. <laughs> so then I get this running start and I, I jump over the chain, but see, I was wearing flip-flops at the time. And 
The thing about flip-flops is they're not the best foot attire if you're going to be doing uh, suburban parkour, which I was what I was doing that day. So uh, technically my body made it over the chain, but my flip-flops didn't. They got caught. The lips of the flip-flop got caught on the chain. So what moments ago was just a father taking his daughter for ice cream. Now, to the outside observer, looks like this small child has stumbled across a drunken barefoot homeless guy passed out in the street. Not, it was not my best look, but uh, anyway, so since then, I've tried to taper my ego a little bit more, especially when I'm at the gym, you know, when I'm working out, you know, I try to keep my workouts a lot more practical. So I'm not training for the Olympics, I'm not training to be a superhero anymore. Now, I train for grocery shopping. That's what I train for. My entire workout regimen is completely optimized to make sure my grocery bag carrying efficiency is at its maximum. So I do a lot, I do a lot of, uh, I do a lot of weighted step up lunges, a lot of these with the dumbbells, you know. It's ideal for carrying the groceries up the stairs. I live on the third floor, I got no elevator, so I'm always carrying the groceries up the stairs. So my ego, it, I don't know if you guys have this problem, I have to bring all of my groceries in in one trip. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how many bags I have, there could be 20 bags, it's just like I gotta get them all in in the first trip. I'm never going back. I think it's like classic male superhero thinking, I think that's what it is. It's like we, we gotta, what if, what if I was strong enough to bring them all in at once? That's what I think. The one exception is the jumbo toilet paper. I will leave that in the trunk for days. You know, because it, the thing about the jumbo toilet paper is it, it requires an entire arm to carry in, so it completely throws a wrench in my whole bring all the bags in one at once uh, routine. So it's not ideal. And I Don't think it's. Tape it to your head. <laughs> And I think, uh, so, so the issue is, I think it's like, uh, for me, my ego is like, leaving a bag in the trunk, it's like leaving a man on the battlefield. It's just like, I can't do it. It's like a, it's like a leftover war instinct. Yeah, but the one exception is the toilet paper. I look at that toilet paper, my arm's full of bags, I'm like, still got a couple rolls left. I can make it through the weekend. I was like, I'll split the plies if I have to. That's why I splurge for the two ply. <laughs> And then I got my arms full of bags, and then I just, I closed the trunk with one of these, with just a scissor kick, just like a, a crescent click trunk close. That's another one I train at the gym, so I do, I do a lot of the step up lunges, I got the trunk close crescent kick. Another one I like to do is the, uh, the kettlebell farmer's carry. So I got the kettlebells and I walk with them. It's, it's really ideal when your car is parked really far from the Costco entrance, which for me is all the time. Does, that, does anybody else shop at Costco here? Any Costco people here? It's a, it's a bit of a stressful experience, isn't it? The Costco, it's not for everyone. I think Costco is the only grocery store that comes with its own traffic cop. I'm always trying to find, I'm always trying to find the ideal time to go to Costco, so I try to avoid like, oh, I don't want to go near payday, I don't want to go after work, I don't want to go on the weekends, I'm like, Tuesday afternoons, that's a good time to go. I don't know if you've ever been to Costco on a Tuesday afternoon, but you, you might as well be going to a Rolling Stones concert. The amount of people in the parking lot on a Tuesday afternoon is insane. If, if you're the Costco traffic cop, that's, that's going to be a fun thing to see on your schedule as a cop, right? You're like, okay, Sunday we got Homicide, oh, that's pretty good. Tu Monday we got the SWAT team, uh, Tuesday Costco, damn it, damn it. Looks like I'm trading in my gun for a nice construction worker fluorescent vest. The only day of the week I get to combine my two village people outfits, cop and construction worker. That's gonna be fun. Just what I signed up for. Punishment. So I'm moving. I'm moving soon. I got a move coming up. Has anybody? Has anybody have a move coming up? Has anybody moved recently? A couple people. Okay. That's a bit of a stressful experience, right? The See, the grocery shopping, that's a solo mission. 
But moving, you have to assemble and command an entire team of moving helpers. I've done so many moves now, I've done about 15 moves, that I've come to realize there's really only five different types of people you can ask to help you move. And everyone you know that you've ever asked to help you move has, falls into one of these five categories. I call them the five moving archetypes. And I'm gonna take you through them one at a time. So, so number one is reliable guy. So a reliable guy is ideal. He's usually your best friend. He's somebody you know, he's loyal, he's a mensch. He's the type of guy that will help you, that will pick you up at the airport on short notice. Reliable guy, he shows up on time, he works hard, he doesn't complain. Ideally, your whole moving team is made up of reliable guys. But normally you're lucky if you get one. So okay? So a peg down from reliable guy, we got lazy guy, right? So lazy guy doesn't work very hard. He shows up at noon. He's like, oh, you guys are uh, you're hard at work already, huh? Uh, is, that, uh, is that chair going down? Why don't you give me the cushion? I'll take the cushion. No, not the chair. You can take the chair. I'll take the cushion. Still got a free hand, though. Uh, why don't you give me that Swiffer? I'll take the Swiffer. The cushion and the Swiffer, that's a full load. Yeah. What do you say after this load we take a nice uh, two hour lunch? How's that sound? So that's lazy guy. A peg down from lazy guy, we got unreliable guy. So unreliable guy, he looks really good on paper. He's usually somebody that's loosely related to you, like a cousin or a brother-in-law. He's very physically fit and capable. He's always off on the weekends. You think he would feel some familial obligation to help you? He does not. He usually owns a truck. <laughs> Ideal for helping people move? Doesn't matter. Reliable guy is never available. You could call him up, you can give him all the notice in the world, you can call him up and be like, hey Dave, what are you doing 19 Saturdays from now? He's always got some golfing tournament. Oh, I suppose January is a popular time for recreational golf. All right, that's fine, you can't help me, all right. Can I at least use your truck? No. I hate you, Dave. Yeah, I'll see you at the reunion. So that's unreliable guy. But there is somebody that's worse than unreliable guy. A peg down. So the guy that's worse than unreliable because at least unreliable guy is consistently unreliable. You can rely on him for that. But the guy that's worse than unreliable guy is bailout guy. Because unreliable guy, he's not reliable, but bailout guy, he screws you. And you all know a bailout guy. If you've ever done a move, See, Bailo guy, it's, uh, he's, you've confirmed with him three times. It's the day before the move, and there's just a disturbance in the force. Something's not right. So you call up, you call up Bailo guy, you're just like, Hey, Greg, uh, yeah, so we're on for uh, 9 a.m. tomorrow, right? What? What do you mean you can't make it? He's always got some weird excuse. It's just, back injury? What do you mean back injury? How did that happen? Admitting accident? That doesn't make any sense. He's like, yeah, I tore my dorsus, trapezius, temporalis, paraspinus. It's very serious. Very serious. I just got an excuse. Yeah, it's very serious. Chiropractors, acupuncturists, everybody's involved. The doctors say I may never be able to help anyone move again. That's how bad it is. So bailout guy bails out. Then you gotta find, which brings us to number five, replacement guy. Now replacement guy, replacement guy's a bit of a scramble. It's the Friday before the move, you're kinda, you're looking around the office. Uh, what about Shirley? Did Shirley, huh? she's got that arthritic knee, I don't know, I don't think she'd make it. What about Bill? Can we ask Bill? No, uh, no, Bill's got COPD, he'll probably die. He won't, he won't survive the move. What about Ken the copy guy? Can we ask Ken? Yeah, can we ask Ken? You know what? I, I think I saw Ken left two of those giant water jugs up the stairs once and he didn't even break a sweat. 
Oh, Ken's the guy. Ken's the guy. So you ask Ken as your replacement guy, one day notice, miraculously, he's available. He's got his whole Saturday free. This guy you don't even know, and he's gonna help you move. Not only is Ken available, he ends up being more reliable than a reliable guy. He shows up an hour early, he brings everybody coffee. By the end of the day, it's just you and Ken, this guy you don't even know. Reliable guy, he went home at 5 p.m. after a reliable eight hours. Lazy guy went home at three after his two hour lunch. Unreliable guy, and he, well, he was home the whole time. And bailout guy, well, we don't know where bailout guy is, but we hope he's in pain. We hope he's in pain. <laughs> yeah, by the end of the day, it's just you and Ken, this guy you barely know. And you're like, that's it, buddy, Ken. We're done, man. We're done. I'll tell you what, though, Ken. You stick around an extra ten minutes and help me screw all the legs back on the couches. I will make it a priority to learn your last name on Monday. How does that sound? <laughs> all right, that's my time, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>